Many, many years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Lapland, traveling with some relatives of mine who lived in Europe. And Lapland is the Arctic Circle of Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Now, when you go to Lapland in the summer, you have the opportunity to see the sun all day long, except for about one minute. The sun rises at 12.01 in the morning, and it sets at 11.59 in the evening. One minute of darkness. You actually watch the sun go down, and then you watch the sun come right back up. <laughs> That's the phenomenon because of the angle of the earth in the summertime. Now, do you know what happens in the winter? Tragically, just the reverse. They live in almost 24 hours of darkness. I would lose my mind. <laughs> so one of the villagers, not all the way up in Lapland, but in a northern uh, part of uh, Norway, he was a, a scientist who came up with this idea. Since in the middle of winter, they would get about 10 minutes of light, he put a series of mirrors all around. This sounds like a scout project to me, by the way. <laughs> he put a series of mirrors all the way around the town square so that they could reflect as much light as possible for the 10 minutes that they had it. And all the villagers would come out. And that was in the middle of the day, right? In the middle of the winter, the middle of the day is when they had their 10 minutes of light. And that was it. Why is it that all the villagers would come out? They were drawn to the light, like a lighthouse. A city set on a hill, we hear in the gospel. Do you know what he's talking about? It's Jerusalem. Jerusalem was on the hilltop in the middle of Israel, in that holy land, and it was considered a lighthouse. On the Feast of Tabernacles, by the way, for eight days, that's where we get octave celebrations, more than a week, it's eight days. It was lit for 24 hours every day. Right, you know the great uh, altar of the lamp st stand in the temple, and that was always burning every day, all year long, right? God is the light of the world. Jesus said that of himself. I am the light of the world. Well, what would happen is they'd light up the entire temple and all the grounds for eight days to remind the people of that revelation. Light. What about salt? Salt was used on the sacrifices. Remember, they had animal sacrifices. Now, what's the value of salt? Number one, it's a preservative. We're so used to refrigeration and freezers, you know, we've forgotten that a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, and thousands of years beyond that, people preserved their meat and fish with salt. It's also a healing agent. Didn't your mother ever make you gargle with salt water? You hated it, but it works, right? It cleanses. So salt, in addition to giving life, preserving life, cleansing, it also gives flavor. Would you ever eat your french fries without salt? <laughs> and I know some of you have said your doctor won't let you have salt, but I know you put chili on it or you put green, red pepper, black pepper. You do something, right, to give it flavor. And so Jesus is telling us, this is shocking, by the way, after he gives them the highest calling of every Christian, which is to live the Beatitudes. Mamma mia, that's a challenge, right? We heard that last week. Now, this week, he says, you are the light of the world. You are the salts of the earth. Really? Now, we can get the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. That's, we recognize the light in him. But he's saying, now, you? If you've ever been to a baptism, there are several candles that burn. The Easter candle, Paschal candle, the Jesus candle, whatever you would like to call it, the tallest candle, right, is put up in the sanctuary. And then for every child to be baptized or adult, there is a smaller candle. 
and it is lit from the Jesus candle. Why? Because you are the light of the world. That's our vocation, to bring light in the midst of the darkness. I know some of you shared with me how discouraging, horrified you were this week when you found out that the Temple of Satan is opening up in New Mexico. It's based in Salem, Massachusetts, to my recollection, and they're going to open up a, quote, health clinic, TST Health, the Temple of Satan. The, no, it's the Satanic Temple, TST, TST Health, which will provide abortions to anyone as a religious ritual. That's what they're claiming. And you wonder, how is this darkness coming to our land? And you know what my theory is? Where was the first place on the continental USA that the Franciscans proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ? We're right here. It's New Mexico. It's the first place. Where do you think the satanic forces have been fighting the gospel first in the continental USA? Right here. It's been a battle. And friends, we maybe don't want to admit it, but it is a battle. That's why we need scouts who are going to stand up. We've had them for 60 years in this parish, maybe 60 plus years. And the scouts teach us the kind of virtues, or they're practicing the virtues, they're working on practicing the virtues, that we need to stand up to the culture of darkness. I honestly think it might be a good thing that TST Clinic is opening up in New Mexico, because it's going to make people so aware and shocked that you will see the contrast between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. As St. John Paul used to say, the culture of life versus the culture of death. It'll be in your face. You can't run from it. The satanic temple is going to take care of that for us, right? So the kingdom of light requires that we extend his light into the world. The only person to blame for the darkness overwhelming us is ourselves. Jesus said it. You are the light. So you have to be his light. You are the salt. You've got to bring spice and grace into the world by reflecting the light. Now let's talk about eclipses. Do you ever think about the fact that the moon, smaller than the earth, can eclipse the massive sun in the heavens? That the moon can eclipse the sun. How is that possible? Because the moon is in our face relative to the distance of the sun. Now think of the sun as God's grace and a dark moon as our sin. It's nothing compared to the sun, right? The sun is massive, but we've got to get out of the sin in order to see the light, in order to receive the light of Christ and then be his light in the world. Here are some of the virtues that scouts are required to practice. First of all, a scout is trustworthy. You all could probably say this out loud. Loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Now, they can say that very fast. I've heard you say this. They have it memorized. But you have to sometimes slow it down and think about the words. Same thing in our praying, don't we? You know, we can, you can what I call the automatic Catholic, our Father, what in heaven, hallowed be the name of the kingdom. It's like they're going to the racetrack. <laughs> you have to think about the words in order to take the gospel seriously, right? And then the light will begin to shine out of the darkness, will magnify the light, like that scientist up in Norway who came up with a plan to magnify the light. That's our job. The Blessed Virgin Mary was the one who did it most perfectly. Because when they tried to say, well, in fact, her cousin Elizabeth, blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. 
Mary responds, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. In fact, the word in Latin is magnificat, magnify. Mary gives all the credit to God. And that's what we should do. But we have to be vessels, instruments for God. Otherwise, the darkness will win. Now, it won't win in the end. In the end, we know Christ is triumphant. But we need to get with the program, right? We need to start practicing our faith, practicing the virtues, in order that people might look at us and say there's something different. Is there anyone that you know who might look to your life and say, because of the way you live your faith, I'm different? Take, for example, what you heard in the first reading from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. Here they are, having lost everything. The temple had been destroyed. Israel conquered. And Isaiah has the vision of the coming of the Savior and how we might manifest that. This is what he says. The Lord speaking through Isaiah. If you loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the thongs of yoke, let the oppressed go free, share your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless to your house. When you see the naked and cover him, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. In the second book of Chronicles, the Lord speaks about healing the land. If we turn back to God, it will heal the land. Well, here's another prophecy about healing. And righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Now, when scouts go out on climbing trips, don't you have a lead? And you have somebody at the, at the very end, right? You've got to protect one another from the beginning to the end. The Lord wants to do that for us. If we are willing to get in line and start climbing the mountain of the Lord to be a city set on the hill, the Lord will guide us and protect us. The battles will be great, but the accomplishment is marvelous. If somebody in the middle of that pack, as you're climbing the mountain, says, I can't do it, what do you do? What do you do for that guy? If he says, I just can't go on anymore, I'm done, I'm tired, what do you do? You help him get up. You encourage him. In the letter of the Hebrews, it says, encourage each other daily while there is still today. It was a, a great saying <clears throat> many years ago, and it said, it is better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. We cannot allow the darkness to overcome us. In fact, when the dark is so dark, the light is even more brilliant. Think about what light does. You can, let's say you don't have any light on, one of you is wearing a dark blue sweater, another one's wearing a dark green sweater, another one is wearing a dark red sweater. In the dark, it all looks dark. You couldn't tell much difference. When the light shines, you can see the distinction of color. Things are more what they really are in the light. You and I, or better Christians when we walk in the light. And that salt also means flavor. This world needs spicy Christians. It really does, right? Flavorful Christians. If we are all bland Christians and we don't let grace and light shine through us, who wants to be a Christian? What difference do you make? You're just living a little fantasy show, right? You don't really believe it because you're not living it. You're not shining. Okay, folks, we need to shine. We need to really seriously take what the Lord is calling us to be. As you may have noticed in the pews, we have out the annual Catholic appeal envelopes. Some of you have already received yours in the mail to our contributors. And part of the 
theme for this year is rebuild my church. Do you know where the archbishop got that from? St. Francis of Assisi. When our Lord spoke to Francis and said, rebuild my church, and remember he thought it was literally an old Benedictine church that had been abandoned for a b bigger abbey, and he started rebuilding that, and he did rebuild it, and you can see it in Assisi today. But that wasn't the one Jesus was talking about. He was talking about the bigger church. And Francis then begins this order of the friars minor, like the littlest of the friars, and they end up becoming the largest order of religious in the world. Priests, brothers, sisters. The largest in the history of the world. And, oh yes, by the way, they brought us the gospel, right, in the 1500s. Blessed be God. So, rebuilding the church after all that we've been through as a church over the last decades, it is to be a future of hope and healing. Prisoner after Mass yesterday said, you know, where do you get the hope? The hope is Christ Jesus himself, right? He will be faithful. Even when we've been unfaithful, Christ Jesus is still faithful. And he calls us back to himself. Our seminarian for the year, Michael Villavicencio, is in Pecos at the Abbey there. They're hosting a retreat for vocations this weekend. About a dozen young men, several of whom have come either through our school or the parish, contemplating becoming priests. It's through the annual Catholic appeal that we pay for their education, right, once they enter seminary. And it's a long process. Michael will complete, I believe, nine years of education once he's ordained a priest. He'll be a deacon, God willing, next year and a priest the following. But this is another way we can rebuild the church by supporting this good work. So I'll let you look at that and you can either take it home with you, contemplate what you might be able to do to help get our priests ordained and educated. And you may have, as I said, received it already at home. You can mail it directly to the archdiocese or bring it to the parish. You can put it in our collection today, next week, however you choose to be part of the solution and the rebuilding of the church. Finally, I want to recognize some of our scouts who have achieved the rank of eagle. Uh, Nolan Esterly from our parish, Logan Slimp, also from this parish, Colin Wilson from, and Michael Whitford uh, are four that have received Eagle. If you would sta stand, please, and be recognized. <laughs> Let's ask all of you who have been Eagle Scouts. Anybody who's made Eagle Scout, all of them stand up. Let's see how many other Eagle Scouts we have here today. I know you're here. Adults too, I'm talking about. Some of you? Okay, well, we have three here. And I'd like to recognize also all the adults who have worked so hard for scouting in our parish over the years. If you would please stand and be recognized. 